Afternoon, Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. This is going to be episode 108 and it's an update on Tyson Fury. No doubt you're going to see all the headlines, okay? Tyson Fury was filmed, right, um, looking very worse for wear, trying to get into a taxi with his father, John Fury, okay? And the taxi driver apparently wouldn't let him in there because he was very drunk and he looked like he was very wobbly. Okay, and I must say he looked like he was drunk on alcohol. I don't think drugs were involved. I mean, not that I would know, but I think, to be honest with you, um, it doesn't look like he's had any, had any of that Colombian marching powder, any cocaine, right? He looked um, just like a, um, just uh, drunk, you know, with alcohol. He must have, it's, and apparently um, that John Fury saying they had too many strong lagers. Right, but the first thing is, I thought he was a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, okay, and um, part of that is that you don't drink anything at all, do you? I mean, I don't know. Um, when someone says that they're a recovering alcoholic, I mean, they don't just have a few beers or something. I mean, I really don't know. From a personal point of view, I haven't had any alcohol for 22 years, right? That's not because I was an alcoholic. It's because I got my place at university and I wanted a clear head to study first my BA honours degree and then my master's degree. So I didn't want to um, drink alcohol to have a clear head, right? And then it, that became three years, four years, five years. And I thought, well, why Why should I ever drink again? I don't need alcohol. I mean, I'd still eat an, a, cherry, a sherry trifle. You know, if there's any food that's got alcohol in it, I mean, I don't worry about anything like that. I just don't drink alcohol. Okay, so I've had 22 years with it, right? Um... But yes, um, Tyson Fury, right, looking very worse for wear, okay, right, very, very drunk, right, or sort of, uh, um, and as he tries to get into the taxi, right, the taxi driver obviously didn't want to um, take him as a fare because he was drunk, or whether he recognised him, but anyway, the taxi driver tried to drive off with the, um, uh, with the front passenger seat door open, and Tyson Fury kicked out at the car, but it wasn't a violent kick. It wasn't a nasty, like, football hooligan thuggish kind of kick. It was just a flap of his leg, as if to go, Ew, where are you going? We want to get home or something like that, OK? So it was just a, a typical drunk. He was harmless, right? He, he wasn't a threat to anyone, right? More of a threat to himself. I mean, he had shorts on. If he'd have fallen over, he'd have grazed his knee or something like that, right? Well... And I think, to be honest with you, I don't think we should be too hard on um, Tyson Fury because I think he's under a lot of pressure, right, that um, we're not seeing, right, which is behind the scenes, okay? Now, it's alleged, right, that Bob Arum, that Tyson Fury was meant to fly to the United States a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, to meet with Bob Arum on an important meeting, Okay, no doubt discussing his purse at Wembley, you know, the 25 million he's owed. And apparently Tyson Fury was refused entry to the United States. Right, I don't think he went to the um, airport, right? I mean, I think they found out that he weren't allowed to go there. And so he changed plans and went to the south of France, where he is now. And then he had a Zoom call with Bob Arum, and then no doubt they discussed it. And me personally, I think Bob Arum, if he can do anything... To, to, to stop him having to pay Tyson Fury 25 million for the uh, the purse for the uh, Dillian White um, defence at Wembley on April the 23rd, then Bob Arum will do anything, right? Well, you know, he'll, he'll say anything. You know, I can't pay you, Tyson, because they'll freeze the money or, or whatever. Or whether Tyson Fury's had his assets frozen already. You know, he seems a man that's under a lot, a lot of pressure. And given his history, my personal recommendation would be that Tyson Fury gets back to the UK as soon as possible when he books himself into rehab. Is it the Priory or something like that? You know, Tyson Fury should go in there for 28 days, right, and, um, and, and clean himself up. Okay, right, because he's going to, you know, have to face a lot of things that are going to come that are going forward with the Daniel Kennehan inquiry, okay? And in this particular instance, so to be honest with you, I mean, I've been critical of Tyson Fury, but let's get it straight, right? The man is a world-class boxer. He's the heavyweight champion of the world. 
He came back from being on the floor and deserves every single bit of credit he's given for that. I really do believe that. Right? And, he, you know, and he's an incredible sportsman and deserves all the credit that he gets, okay, for what he does in the ring. The only thing that he's got that's against him, right, is the behaviour outside the ring when we're talking about organised crime and his associations with Daniel Kinahan, the Kinahan cartel, and even going back to when he was a kid and the Fiori family, right, connections to criminality, okay, and, you know, and it's yet to come out, you know, allegedly his um, uncle, he's P Peter Fiori, right, he deals in large amounts of cocaine and heroin, right, and that, which has got off of um, Daniel Kinahan, and the money Bob Aaron paid, right, allegedly to um, uh, Daniel Kinahan, $8 million for four fights of, involving Tyson Fury, it wasn't really as an advisor, it was to pay for the drugs that went to Peter Fury, he then sold them on, you know, and I know that, 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 that what's going to happen, Tyson Fury is going to plead innocence and I didn't know all this was going on and all this sort of carry on, which, OK, I can understand why he would do that publicly. But, I mean, you know, come here, listen, right? It's, it's our hostage here talking to you, right? We're having a little fireside chat. So between us, of course, Tyson Fury knew, right? He likes to put himself up as knowing about geopolitics and he likes to do all these things, which is good. I love lifelong learning. Okay, right, but he's a scholar or or a trainee scholar one minute, right, and so he knows all about this and reads and, and that. But on the other hand, when it comes to Daniel Kinahan cartel and criminality, he plays dumb. I don't understand that. I don't know that and all that carry on. Well, I'm not going to accept that because I think Tyson Fury is a lot more intelligent or a lot more clever and shrewd than he's given credit for. Right, and that means, right, that he knows exactly what's going on. He knows everything about the Kinahan cartel, and maybe he got swept up with it and caught up in it, and he, you know, and he got caught um, involved in it, and he and he doesn't know, you know, there's no way out for him, and it's been just like that, and he's tried to distance himself from the Kinahans because of the publicity. But the thing is, right, he had his photograph taken with Daniel Kinahan in Dubai in February, right, which is only three months ago. Okay, he accepted that Hugh Block watch on the video, right, which he's done. His other gifts he's, um, he's received, right, he's, he called um, Daniel Kinahan for Prime Minister on social media over the years and all that praising, right? So if you look at that, okay, take his name away. He's just someone, right, that is that close to Daniel Kinahan. And then you look at the criteria that the Americans, the US, are putting uh, to, to put sanctions on people, right, or to freeze their assets. Well, Tyson Fury ticks all those boxes, doesn't he? Even if he's innocent, let's presume he's innocent, he's got certainly got questions to answer. Okay? Right, so he's obviously going to have to be interviewed under caution by the um, National Crime Agency in the UK and maybe even by the Americans. They may fly over to want to interview him or something like that. So Tyson Fury's a man with a lot of pressure on his shoulders, right, which now, which should should actually see, right, if he wasn't involved in any of this, right, he would pretend he's retiring and then when Joshua fights um, um, Usyk, right, the winner will be a unifying, you know, belt, the biggest of all time, whether it's Joshua or Usyk, whoever wins that one, right, for, a, say, a two-fight deal for undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world, I mean, that should be his swan song. I mean, that should be the way that he goes out. But the way it's looking now, okay, the biggest fight of Tyson Fury's life are going to be two things. One, right, to clean himself up, okay, and give up the alcohol, right, and if he's tempted with drugs again, right, stop all that. So he needs to go to rehab as soon as possible. By the end of the week, as soon as he gets back to the UK, he should go into rehab, even if it's for 14 days. And that would take a bit of pressure off, right? If I was his PR, I'd say, listen, Tyson, right? Well, now you, they've seen you drunk, you've got to say you fell off the wagon, and as soon as you get back to the UK, you're going to go into rehab and try and clean yourself up. Now, that would give you a bit of breathing space because the press will back off for a couple of weeks. And then when you come out all cleaned up and everything... Then you can speak with your lawyers, right, and organise the sit-down, right, the questioning that you've got and the questions you've got to face. 
I mean, that's my advice to him, right, to do. And then the other thing he's got to decide is when he's questioned about the connections with Daniel Kinahan, does he keep his mouth shut, right, and leave himself open, right, to prosecution under the 2002 Proceed to Crime Act, okay, and have his assets frozen if they ain't already frozen? Because what they do, right, under the 2002 Proceed to Crime Act, they come in and if they sus sus suspect someone, if they got a suspicion about someone, they freeze their assets first, they then investigate them, they then interview them, Okay, and then if all, everything turns out to be honest and above board, they would then unfreeze those assets. But in the meantime, right, the person whose assets have been frozen just swings in the wind. So for all we know, his assets could have already been frozen. But let's say they haven't been, and he comes back to the UK, cleans himself up with a bit of rehab, and then he goes and has an interview with a national crime agency under caution, and his lawyers say, make no comment, well, if he does that right, well, then then his assets will be frozen and then he could face possible charges, criminal charges. And I know it's extremely serious to say all these things, right? But this is this this is the reality that we face because the Kinahan cartel has been operating via Instagram, right, and via YouTube for the last 10 years. All the boxes going on there and bigging up Daniel Kinahan and this, that and the other, right? And now, all of a sudden, the chickens have come home to the roost because OFAC and all the people, John O'Driscoll, Gardy, NCA, National Crime Agency, right? The Dutch police, right? All of them, Spanish police, right? All of them have been, um, FBI, have been investigating, right? And they've been building the case up, right? For the last probably 10 years since the case collapsed in, um, Spain, Operation Shovel, I think, or what it was called, when it all collapsed, right? Because the Kinnahans were worth 100 million euros in 2009, okay? Right, then they got charged, right? And then all of a sudden, they had assets of 500 million, and then they had to give them all back to them. And then they moved from Spain to Dubai, to Dubai and have had a billion-dollar drug cartel, right, for the last, what, six, seven, eight years? So that's what, six, seven, eight billion dollars. Now, if you spread it out amongst the other players, Targi and Rafael Imperiali and Eddie Gascon, right, and all the other players, right, well, you know, the, the Kinnahans don't get a billion dollars a year, but I would imagine they probably get, after all the expenses and everything, 300 million, 250 million. Well, let's say they've been doing that for, say, four or five years. That's where you come to the figure that personal wealth of the Kinnahans are one billion dollars. OK, so as this all starts to unravel, OK, we're starting to see the pressure start to build up. I mean, Ty Tyson Fury is not stupid, right? Trust me on that, right? I know he's not stupid, right? But he's going to play stupid and act dumb, OK, when it suits him. And I understand why he's doing it. But there's going to be big decisions, right? You know, he's got to make and he knows and you can see the pressure starting to get to him. OK, and that's what we saw yesterday, right? And we've seen now the um, the video of him being drunk. But to be fair, right, you know, I mean, not, let's not just pile on Tyson Fury. First of all, he was drunk and his father's trying to guide him to a taxi and he's wobbly all over the place, right? And then the taxi driver won't let him get in and he starts to drive away the taxi driver with the passenger door open. And Tyson Fury sees it and he's sort of like, you know, like any person who's trying, like that, and he just puts his leg out, right? And he hasn't even got the strength, right, to lift his leg up, right? So he wasn't doing it in a malicious way, like a kind of MMA kickboxing kind of um, dent in the car or damage it, right? So let's not go over the top, right? You know, and I've been a big critic of Tyson Fury, but in this particular instance... He might not realise it, OK, but that might have been a cry for help. And as I say, I think the best thing, right, that Mrs Fury, pa Paris, and John Fury, the father, they could do is get Tyson Fury back to the UK as soon as possible and book him in a rehab in the Priory or wherever it is, right, for two weeks, right, because that would give everyone a chance to take a deep breath. It will give Tyson Fury a chance to get off the booze and to clean himself up a little bit. It'll give the family time to step back, 
And then after the couple of weeks, well, then when he, when they want him to go in to be interviewed under caution, he can do it with a clear head. But as I say, you see, he obviously knows a lot more than what the public knows or what, what's been printed in the public. Okay, and I think this is just building up. They're saying that Frank Warren, he's walking round, right, with his face, right, is as long as fucking, honestly, right, they're calling him all face, right, because his face is so long. Right, Frank Warren's walking round with a permanent, right, um, unhappy face, to say the least. Right, because he knows what's coming down the tube. See, what actually happened, right, the likes of Frank Warren, Eddie Hearn, Bob Arum, and all the promoters, right, they, they've been um, doing what's called criminal actions, laundering money, avoiding tax, and all this kind of stuff, right, and backhand deals, right, for decades, and that's their little thing that they do, right? And then you've got Barry Hearn, Eddie Hearn's father, right? Who's an absolute whiz, right? He's an absolute five-star accountant. So they do all this fancy accounting and stuff and moving money here and there and everywhere, right? And it all goes on under the radar. Well, all of a sudden, Daniel Kinnahan comes on the firm and then attracts a spotlight of law enforcement because of the Kinnahan cartel, well, not only have they discovered what the Kinnahan cartel has been doing, infiltrating boxing, they've been shining the light on all the naughty, nefarious things, right? The likes of Eddie Hearn, Frank Warren, okay, and all the others, and Bob Arum, have been doing for decades. So that's why they've, they've got long faces, right? It might not necessarily be with the Kinnahan thing. It'll be, be with other things, right, that are coming to light now that would never have seen the light of day, right, if Daniel Kinahan hadn't brought all the heat and the attention on boxing as a whole, right? Because we all know there's cash deals and there's dodgy this and dodgy that and advisor here and advisor there, okay? And that's what happens. But, that, you know, that goes on and they don't investigate that, right, under the radar. Well, that's not, it's come above the radar now. So there's, lot more, you know, there's lots of things that are happening, okay? And I think it's... um. I think it's like a, a quite um, interesting to actually see how it turns out. But, you know, the, the pressure's starting to get to everyone now within that. You know, it's what they call squeaky bum time, right? Like none of them know what's going to happen next. And I think that's the way that um, law enforcement, right, has, has planned this. Okay? Right, they're going to use this, right? Um, and it's even, uh, you know, I used a quote from John O'Driscoll. He said... Right, the law enforcement are going to use this template, the way they've taken down the Kinahan cartel, for future investigations going forward. So that's ominous, right, for criminal cartels, right? What they're saying is, yes, we know you're a criminal cartel and we've got no evidence where we can legally pursue you, but what we're going to do, we're going to name and shame you, we're going to sanction you and squeeze you, okay, and then build a case against you. So even if you're the cleverest criminal in the world and you cover your tracks, right, so well that law enforcement could never, ever catch you legally, right, well, law enforcement said, well, okay, if you want to play dirty, we'll play dirty. And now law enforcement are going to use the tactic of name and shame. Name and shame, cartel, super cartel, right, godfathers and godmothers or whatever it is. So it's their new, it's their new way of going forward. And as I say, right, this is going to be the biggest scandal in the history of boxing. And then it's going to move over into the snooker and then into the soccer and then into the horse racing and then even into things like tennis. OK, this is going to be a, a huge thing. Right? It's going to be the gift that keeps on giving. Right. It's going to go on for years. This will this will this thing will. OK, and by the time it's all finished. Okay, boxing, right, will be unrecognisable from where it is today, May the 19th, 2022. Okay, boxing will never, ever be the same as it is today, right? However, they rebuild it, because boxing is going to be dismantled, and then it's going to be rebuilt. And then hopefully, for the young boxers coming up, maybe if corporate companies get involved, and instead of being signed up to individuals like Eddie Hearn, Frank Warren, Bob Arum, they get signed up by, say, big companies, Disney, you know, Google, Amazon, and all those kind of people, right? Well, if that's the case, Netflix, they sponsor boxers, 
well then the boxes will be treated a lot fairer. Because, I mean, some of the figures that are being quoted, right, the boxers have to give, you know, the trainer, say, 10%, 20% to the manager. Then there's all the expenses. So in the end, right, for every $1,000, right, a boxer gets, right, he'll be lucky to walk away with $100. So the boxer who's doing all the grunt work, who's doing all the hard work, right, and getting hit in the ring, they're getting roughly 10% of, the, of what they earn. And as you get down to the bottom, right, you're getting boxers who are professional boxers earning, uh, um, you know, $100, $500 a week or even less. See, it's all very well looking at Tom, um, at Tyson Fury and the twenty-five million, Terence Crawford. I think that was twenty million dollars. Okay, but as you go down, right, it's like in anything. When you get up the top in, you know, in American football, Tom Brady. But then when you get down to the lower leagues, right, the grassroots, you know, the people I like to stand up for, the underdog, right, well, they're treated terribly. And maybe if the corporate people come in, right, maybe they will be treated better. You know, maybe Netflix can start, you know, um, sponsoring, you know, boxing clubs, you know, or Disney or someone like that. You know, the big networks come in and then they do away with these individual promoters. You know, a bit like, as I said yesterday, right, when, when they did in Las Vegas, when they cleared the mob out, OK, um, corporate companies came in and they used junk bonds to rebuild the casinos. And now you want to go into a casino in Las Vegas, okay, you've got to provide a social security number and prove where you got the money from. That's why there's no money laundering now no more. And they cleaned up the acting in Vegas because there's plenty of money to be earned le legitimately and legally. Like in boxing, there's still plenty of money to be earned. Okay, it doesn't have to be criminal money and illegal money. So anyway, there's a little 22 um, minutes one, right? This is um, episode 108, okay? Art Hostage, episode 108. Tyson Fury gets drunk, needs to get back to the UK, and Tyson Fury needs to go to rehab, okay? Right, like the, um, what's her name, Amy Winehouse song. They need to go to rehab. And I say that with the best of intentions because I think, to be honest, the worst is yet to come for Tyson Fury. Okay, but I wish him the best of luck and I hope he goes to rehab. Because otherwise, the way he looked um, last night, right, this is a downward spiral. And he's at the top of the spiral. And hopefully he can nip it in the bud. Maybe his family can have an intervention, right, and get him into rehab. And that'll give him a bit of breathing space. Because what's coming next, right, is going to be probably the biggest fight of Tyson Fury's life. So anyway, Art Hostage, episode 108, Tyson Fury, drunk, needs to go to rehab. Art Hostage, signing off.